rise for worship.
are so worthy of our praise. You are so worthy of your name, Lord. And I just pray that you continue to walk with us and reveal to us the wonders of your word today. We love you and we pray all this in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, worship team. Hello, Journey Church of Atlanta. Good afternoon and happy Lunar New Year and happy Super Bowl Sunday. There's a lot going on this weekend and also a lot going on in our church, so let's get into it. If you are here for the first time or consider yourself new, welcome. We love that you are here. We will have an amazing welcoming table who will want to get to know you that we set up after service in the foyer behind those double doors. My name is Justin and I'll be giving the announcements for today. First announcement, as a reminder, we have a general body meeting today, right after service. It's going to be in the fellowship hall. So after service is over, please make your way to fellowship hall to fellowship there so we can get started promptly. Our second announcement is eat and meet. So eat and meet is every single third Sunday of the month, and that is next week, February 18th. Um, it's a great way to meet new people in our church, to invite coworkers, friends uh, out to our church as well. Amazing food will be offered by our hospitality team. It will start at 12, 15 p.m. right before service. And please use the side doors to enter to not serve service here going on that, during that time. The last announcement is a big one, Missional March. So traditionally in the past, we've spent this month supporting our short-term missionary teams through fundraising and prayer. And we're still going to do that this year, but we also wanted to empower members of our church to live missionally in their communities as well. We have partnered with seven different organizations. I'm going to go through all seven of them. I was advised not to, but I think it's very important. I think it's good for you guys to get a good summary of all the amazing opportunities presented to you guys to serve. Um, I'll make it really quick. So I'm going to say the organization, the organization name and the serve opportunity. Starting with City Hope Community, they're looking for volunteers for their thrift shop and Sunday school teachers for, sun, for children and youth. Connected Vine is looking for teachers for kids clubs after school program and organizers for arts and craft supplies. English for International is looking for volunteers to help English conversation with international families. Ethne Dental is looking for volunteers for oral hygiene assembly kits. House of Cherith is looking for female volunteers only for welcome pack assembly, mom and child play day, or a Georgia Aquarium day visit. Justice Ventures International is looking for runners for their fundraiser 5K and race day volunteers. And Seven Bridges to Recovery is looking for volunteers to pack lunches to serve at their homeless ministry. If any of that interests you, you guys should find out more information at a general body meeting. They'll go into more detail than I did just now. Um, or you can find all the information on our church website as well, which you can access through a QR code, which I'll give a second to pull up and give you a moment to scan as I talk. This will give you all the information about our church announcements as well as our missional march service opportunities. One thing to know about our missional march service opportunities is that they are all associated with certain dates in March, and each one of those opportunities have a limited sign up for volunteers. So if you're interested in anything, make sure that that date works for you and you sign up before spots are gone. You can sign up individually with your friends, your family group. It's a great way to get involved with your community. All right, now we're going in time. We're going to highlight some serve teams. We'll be highlighting two serve teams today, events team and creative team. They're going to talk about, about what their serve team does, starting with Leslie and Unhi from events team. Hi, everyone. I'm Leslie. This is Unhi, And we're just going to share a little bit about events team, what it's all about, and how you can get involved. So um, as you all know, our church holds a lot of different events throughout the year, things like Labor Day Picnic, Journey Bowl, College Retreat, Eastside Retreat, the list goes on. Um, hopefully some of you have attended some of these and been blessed by them. Um, events team is actually the one that helps coordinate all of these events and helps prepare an event and um, hopefully just create a space where God can really move in each event. Um, so responsibilities include basically working with vendors and venues, with the other serve teams and church staff to make the events come to life. Um, you have the flexibility to work on one or two events per year, depending on your uh, bandwidth. And yeah, there's nothing more to say to that. And <laughs> join us. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, next is Megan and Linda for creative team. Hello, I'm Megan and this is Linda and we're co-leads for creative team. Um, so our mission statement is building up the church body through digital media. Um, but not only are we showcasing what the church does to the congregation, but we also um, want to do that to the greater community, um, that whether that be the Elena community or um, further. Um, but here's like a little glimpse of what we do. We do graphics. Um, we do a lot of social media. Um, we do photo and video. And we also are looking for a project manager because um, we do work with a lot of other serve teams um, and staff. And as the events team mentioned, we have a lot of events that um, all of you get to attend. Um, our college service also gets to attend those. And um, so because we have so many events, a lot of what we do is project-based. Um, so uh, in order to help manage all of them, we are looking for a project manager. <laughs> Um, but we're also looking for a photo and video. So if you're interested in photography, um, you do photography as a hobby, um, you want to get into the creative space, um, we're always looking for people, and you're welcome to join us. Um, there are a lot of resources that we have um, if you're just a beginner. So don't be afraid if you don't feel like you're super creative. Um, we have members that can help you, and we have resources to help you um, grow your creative spirit. Do you have anything? I'm here for emotional support, but I want to mention first photography. We want people in like different demographics. So for example, the married men's retreat, I asked some guy to take photos on his phone because there's no married men. Oh, yeah, not yet <laughs> that are going. So it's just, to, there's so many events that cover different demographics. We would like to have coverage in each. The end. Awesome, thank you creative team and events team. Um, now we're gonna go into time of offering where we honor God with our finances. You can access our offering page through journeychurchatl.com slash give. Give you a moment to do that and then I'll close us in prayer. Close us in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the amazing opportunities that you have given us within our church through serve teams and outside of our church through uh, opportunities to live missionally. God, we thank you for the work that you have already been doing. Um, thank you for your servants who have already been doing so much work uh, in the background, in our, the front lines as well. Lord, I pray that you would invite us to join you in your mission, invite us to join you in what you're doing, Lord, empower us, uh, give us a heart for your people, and that, may, that we may be able to glorify you and to serve you, Lord. I also pray for today's speaker, Pastor Dan, God, I pray for um, your servant, I pray as he gives the message that you may speak through him, may bless him, and be able to bless us through him. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, Justin. Two years in a row, general body meeting on Super Bowl Sunday. I don't know. What are we doing? <clears throat> Happy Valentine's Day also. Happy uh, Lunar New Year. Um, President's Day is coming. <clears throat> I've got a birthday next week. Thank you. And my mother. Now, I don't want to get in trouble for pointing her out, but if you would just say, happy birthday, Joyce, in that direction, I'd appreciate it. One, two, three. Happy birthday, Joyce. All right. That way I can't get in trouble. 
I'm not even looking, over the <coughs> looking in that direction. I'd like to start today, um, we're going to be talking about prayer. How did that feel? We're going to be talking about prayer, and uh, I promise you that's not bad news. That's not like you're not doing enough of it about to be coming in this sermon. It's actually great news. And before I get there, I'd like to read a few letters uh, from kids to pastors. Not my kids and not this pastor, just some general letters from kids to pastors. And they're going to lead us into this topic, uh, which again, I said is going to be great, prayer. Dear pastor, I would, not, or I would like to go to heaven someday because I know my brother won't be there. <laughs> Stephen, age eight, Chicago. Dear Pastor, my father says I should learn the Ten Commandments, but I don't think I want to because we have enough rules already in my house. Joshua, age 10. Dear Pastor, my father should be a minister. Every day he gives us a sermon about something. Robert, age 11, Atlanta. Dear Pastor, how does God know the good people from the bad people? Do you tell him? Marie, age 9. Dear Pastor, please say a prayer for our Little League team. We need God's help or a new pitcher. <laughs> Alexander, age 10. Dear Pastor, I liked your sermon on Sunday, especially when it was finished. <laughs> Ralph, age 11, Akron. And dear Pastor, who does God pray to? Is there a God for God? Sincerely, Christopher, age 9. That's a great question, actually, that a child perceived of this loss, if God didn't have something of that relationship ex that exists when we pray and commune with God. And he wanted to know, does God have that too? Profound question. The title of my sermon today is Jesus's farewell prayer. That's actually a <clears throat> very common title for the chapter for chapter 17 in the book of John. And if you haven't been with us, we're in the middle of a very long study on John, and we're in the middle of that on talking about John 13 through 17, kind of as a unit. 13 was the washing of the feet and the introduction of a long monologue chapters 14, 15, and 16. And then today's prayer is kind of the end of that section. And I've been doing um, much of that. Pastor Dandy uh, joined back up in again yesterday and did most of chapter 16. And here's a little PS. And I haven't said this yet to P. Dandy either. Three times prior to chapter 16, there were these passages about ask whatever you want and it'll be given to you. And I didn't know how to cover them, and I always pushed it off. And I said, when I get to past chapter 16, I'll sit down, I'll buckle down, and I'll study, and I'll come up with the best I can do of what I think Jesus is saying. But then he preached on it last week, that section of verses. And so I don't have to. And uh, we've got a lot of Bible left before we circle back to John again. So if you're still here in about 50 years, you know, maybe we'll come back to that topic or something. <laughs> Today, I'm covering, uh, uh, kind of like he did last week, almost a whole chapter, a whole chapter. Uh, not something I do normally, but it's, it's fitting and it fits well with how this chapter is organized. It's in three sections. Jesus prays to be glorified. Jesus prays for the disciples. Jesus prays for us. And so I'm going to pray for us today, and then we're going to cover those three sections in reverse order. We're going to start at the end of the chapter, move to the middle, and end with the beginning. And it'll become clear why, perhaps, as we do it. So let me pray. Father, it is a privilege to be here together as a body of believers in you, as disciples wanting to follow after you, and as we pause to listen to your words of prayer 
the Son to the Father. Lord, may they bury themselves deep in our minds, deep in our imaginations, deep in our hearts, deep in our souls. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Did you ever stop to think how amazing it is that you can say, yeah, my God prayed for me? That's not a normal religious thought. That's kind of the opposite of how these things work. Right? Religion is set up so that man might pray to God. That's the normal flow of things. But we actually have the type of God as a triune God, as three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, where one of those persons came in the flesh and was incarnated among us as a human being, relating still to his Father, where we can say, Wow, once upon a time, God, my God, prayed for me. It's quite mind-bending. It's quite not anything we might expect. It's not, it's not the normal course of things in, in the world of religions. Here's what I'd like to do with this third section. Um, since Jesus is praying for us, would you, would you actually stand with me? And let's read together, and we'll have to bow out of the uh, PowerPoint, and if you could pull up verses 20 through 26 in the NIV. And we're just going to read together. Um, <clears throat> some churches stand every time they read God's word. Um, I'm okay with you honoring it while sitting or standing. But I just thought, number one, I'll hear you better if I get that diaphragm not so scrunched down with you sitting. So we're going to read Jesus' the section of his prayer there. He is actually praying these things for the believers that live today and in all time. Do we have it? John 17, beginning in verse 20. Okay. Ready, go. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one Father. Just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. All the way to 26. Verse 24 is after that. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you. And they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Thank you very much for doing that. You may sit down. <clears throat> in this privileged look where Jesus is not talking to himself, but where the Father and the Son are relating to one another, where he is praying as, the, um, as a human being on earth, still as God, praying to his Father in heaven, we get this privileged look on what, what do they talk about when they're, they're talking to each other? What do they care about? What do they want? And in wanting to sort of pull out the, the common threads and the repeated phrases that I saw in this passage, I found myself moving away from trying to make like an outline, which you know fits it into maybe how my brain was educated or trained to work, and instead pulling out some of these patterns and just observing them and naming them. And so first, what I saw was there's three times where unity comes up in this prayer for you and for me. That first verse was, 
him moving on from who he had just been praying for, and we'll get to that in a minute, and that was the disciples in front of him. And now he's praying for the believers that would believe in him for all time. And three times he prays for unity. Verse 21, that all of them may be one. Verse 22, that they may be one. Verse 23, so that they may be brought to complete unity. <clears throat> Does God want us to be unified, do you think? Can we get a unified opinion on this? Okay. <clears throat> God wants us to be unified. In addition to the re repetition of the word unity, we have seven in blank in this phrase. God in Jesus, 21. Jesus in God, 21. Us in them both, 21. Jesus in us, 23. God in Jesus, 23. Love that God has for Jesus in us, verse 26. And Jesus in us, 26. It reminded me very much of Paul's later theme of in Christ, describing who we are. We are those in Christ. Seven times in this prayer, there's in something. And then finally, I noticed, of course, some grammar. There's some so that phrases. Um, and maybe there's just the word that, or maybe the word because could be there, or in order that. But it's all this, something happens, okay, I, I uh, exercise and eat well so that I can be in shape. So that tells us, well, this is the thing that that, that person cares about. That's what they want. And so when we see so that in these phrases, and we saw uh, one already in verse um, well, hang on, I'm just going to read them. In verse 21, so that the world may believe. Why is this important to notice so that? Because it tells us God wants certain things. God cares about certain things. And what you find after the so that tells you what that is. God's desire is that the world may believe. Verse 22, that they may be one or so that they may be one. Verse 23, so that they may be brought to complete unity. We already saw those uh, passages, but it tells us the fact that it is structured with a so that there. God wants this. God cares about our unity. Jesus, in praying to God, reveals they're hungering after us being unified. And then verse 26 is the fourth one in this section. In order that the love you have for me may be in them, and that I myself may be in them. Again, the in theme. Jesus desires this intimate, close relationship and that God's love for the Son would be that same love in us. Then in verse 24, Jesus just comes right out and actually says the words, I want. We don't have to deduce what he wants. He says, Father, I want something. And what does he say? I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory. Now, it might be a little strange as you stop and realize that Jesus is talking to people right in front of him, that he's praying, I want them to be with me where I am. But, but he is thinking ahead to the ascension because the crucifixion is coming the next day. He's going to be raised from the dead. He's going to be on earth for 50 days, and he's going to be sending back to the Father. But his prayer is that all of us would be not only with him, but what? See my glory. This is something that has not been possible since the Garden of Eden. So Adam and Eve walked with God in the cool of the day was the phrase used in Genesis to basically just talk about human space and God's space being the same space. And Adam and Eve walked with God in the cool of the day. And the curse separated those spaces. And Jesus came to begin and initiate new creation, which is the realigning of God's space and human space. And the end of that story is a new heaven and a new earth. God's space and human space being coming into being the same thing again. This prayer here is Jesus saying, I, I'm longing for that 
day when they can see my glory, that we could see God and not be killed by it. Because since Adam and Eve, that's been the result. You remember Moses? He asked God, um, kind of like a, a little kid's letter to a pastor, just expressing sincere, basic desire. Can I see you? I, I'd like to see you. And that, that was Moses' request. And he can't. He can't. It's not because God is deciding that he can't. Like, he, he literally could not have lived through it. And yet, what does God do? Because God's desire is still for the same thing that Moses wants. He hides him in a cleft of the rock, and he puts his hand over him, and he walks past until his face is no longer visible. And then he takes his hand away, and then Moses sees God's back. It's a metaphor for what humans long for and what we see here, what God himself longs for. I want those you have given me to see my glory together with me. Revelation 22 speaks of that day. No longer will there be any curse. When did the curse come? Back in the Garden of Eden. And since that time, there's now this break in what the original design for humans and God to be. And at the end of the age, no longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. The Garden of Eden restored, finally. And this prayer in John 17 is the Father and the Son communing with one another, Jesus knowing what their original plan and hope for humanity was, that they will make it happen in the end, and Christ coming is how that is accomplished. No one comes to the Father but by me. God is always seeking a people bearing his name to represent to all the rest that bear his image. Humankind is meant to rule over creation for good. And Jesus prays towards that. All right, just to review the themes in this prayer for us, unity in blank and then this window onto certain things we know God wants because of either Jesus saying I want it or Jesus praying do this so that I actually had a lot more to say about this passage and I decided to move it out to one of the talks that I would do during uh, missional Sunday so we can look forward to covering just this passage a little bit longer there. Um, my working title is something like Unity as Evangelism. All right. The next prayer, moving backwards, is the one for the disciples. And I decided on the stage, midstream, during the college sermon, that I perhaps don't agree with myself. I need to take some time and look back. I'm not positive it's just the 12. Maybe it is. But maybe some of the named women disciples were there. Maybe some other unnamed disciples were there. I'm not exactly sure that Jesus only at this juncture during this prayer has only those 12 men um, listening to him. But he is definitely praying for the disciples that are present. And here's what I'd like, us, like to encourage us to do. We're not going to read through this section together because it's quite lengthy. But when we read the Bible, and when we skip the steps that would cause us to say, okay, this prayer now is different than that one we just finished, or this section of the prayer, and it's actually for the disciples, that is not to say that Jesus would not also desire some of the same things for you, that he prays for these disciples. But don't skip immediately to... Jesus wants this for me because I'm reading it in my Bible. My QT had this verse, and therefore, this is for me. Maybe. Maybe. But we, we daren't skip the steps of starting with, well, this prayer here is Jesus praying for his disciples. And maybe he wants some of these things for me too. 
But the section that says what he wants from me specifically is in the verses we read out loud together. Why, why do I give this caution? Simply because we can tend with that sort of approach to simply do this. We find the verses that feel good and that we like and read them a lot more often and claim them and perhaps miss some of the verses that we don't like so much. And God would also use those to challenge us and grow us and change us. So, in summary, read this section here first realizing this is Jesus' prayer for those disciples that are with him right now. And he only prays two things. He only petitions the Father for two things. Uh, verses 6 to 10 and some of the other verses are him, you know, proclaiming things, which is still praying. But if you get down to petition, what does he actually ask God to do? There's only two. Verse 11 and 15, he prays for protection. He prays for protection. Now, I don't believe this is kind of like physical bodyguard. Uh, Roman soldiers are trying to slit their necks kind of protection because in verse 15, he names the evil one. And so I believe Jesus is petitioning the Father, protect them from a spiritual enemy who is after them and may use human agency to accomplish his desires. But Jesus is on this plane of there is a spiritual enemy after the soul of my disciples and they are in danger. Father, protect them. Number two, sanctify them. Jesus prays, sanctify them in verses 17 and 19. And I can recall kind of back in Bible school days hearing some of the older guys make jokes like, you know, I lost my sanctification as a way of kind of like talking about, you know, they slipped up or they sinned or they saw something they shouldn't have seen or something. But other than that, sanctification has not become a word that we use super commonly. And so I have brought along today my thesaurus. I would like you to look at the screen. And I've got three, not three definitions, but there are three definitions for sanctification in the dictionary, just the regular dictionary. And up here I've got, go ahead, you can show it. I've just got the three groups of synonyms for sanctification that you can find there in the, th in the thesaurus. And I'm going to give you 30 seconds to skim that. Which one do you think Jesus is praying? Which one do you think Jesus is praying? Just read through it. Just, just read through it. What? Sure, let me pinch and zoom, Kyle. Did you see the text on the missional march slide? I could read that at the college service. Like the bottom one that was like that big. Yeah. They, got, they got a good projector over there. Can you really not read that? All right, you're just going to have to vote anyway. Pray about it for 30 seconds. I hear you. All right, pissed up. Zero is not a vote, so I want a one or a two or a three. And there will be no picking out of what you voted. There will be no shaming if you get it wrong. I just want to see, do you think Jesus is praying for one, two, or three? Ready, set, vote. Okay, thank you. Listen to verse 19. Jesus prays. For them, my disciples, I sanctify myself that they too may be truly sanctified. Therefore, I don't think you could have voted two for what Jesus is praying. I think two refers to what I was saying about when I joked and when we use the term, you know, to talk about my becoming uh, purer. But I believe here Jesus is praying the first one. Oh. Did I have it again? Oh, it's in bold. Maybe Kyle can read it. Consecrate, make holy, make sacred, bless, hollow, set apart. In other words, I believe Jesus is not here saying, 
Lord, sanctify these disciples and make them to be cleaner, to, you know, be forgiven, to live a holy, pure life. It's, it's less that and more just setting them apart for a purpose, a holy purpose of God. The church will be formed in these next days, and Jesus is praying, Lord, sanctify these disciples. Um, he, he can't be praying that for himself, obviously, with the second one. And I don't think he's praying that definition for the disciples. There's nothing about washing sins away in this use of sanctification. Uh, three is interesting. I think it's basically the same idea with human power attached to it. Um, basically declaring something to be holy, whether or not it is holy or right or good or not. Uh, we're going to sanctify this and enforce it. And that's why number three cannot be it. I don't, I don't think anyone did vote three, but if you did, don't feel bad. I think number one has power as well, but this is actual, the holy source is behind the power of definition number one. And God is sanctifying these disciples. Why does Jesus want to sanctify himself? So that his disciples would be sanctified. And again, we, we get another so that. He, he cares about us being sanctified. He cares about us being set apart. That's what he wants. And that was the first of four more so that's in this section. 19 has one. Verse 13 has one. Again, working backwards. So that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. Now, everything within me wants to cry out and say, yes, Jesus is praying that I'll have joy. I need to remember, you know, Jesus right here is praying that his disciples will have joy, that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. And I also hope and pray that I too can claim this because nothing makes my heart sing quite like thinking that Jesus might actually want and desire to give me joy. And then verse 12, so that scripture would be fulfilled. This is a verse about Judas. God cares about his word. All scripture will be fulfilled. And then verse 11, so that they may be one. This is the only area of overlap in the prayer for us and the prayer for these disciples. The only time he repeats himself and prays the same thing for both groups is right here. That they may be one. Notice that. Do you think that's significant? A little bit significant? Or a lot of it significant? Last section, Jesus' first section. Verses 1 through 5, Jesus prays, to be glorified. I'm just going to read uh, 1b through 3. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. The hour has come. The cross is tomorrow. Glorify your son so that your son may glorify you. By now you don't need to tell me that that so, so that tells us. <clears throat> the father and the son care about glory. They want to glorify each other. And the second so that happens to be in verse 2. Jesus is granted authority so that he might give eternal life. God is the one that thought up eternal life for humans and wants to give it to us. It's his desire. Jesus' prayer to the Father to glorify your Son, Father, glorify your Son, clues us in to how the cross is Jesus' means of being glorified. Jesus ascends his throne, takes his throne at the cross. He takes victory over the last enemy, and this is a, a term from Paul. Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 talks about death being the final enemy. And Jesus defeats it by doing something that no one expected. He, he succumbs to it. And in that, defeats it. 
and therefore becomes something that Paul also calls him the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep when he is resurrected. And that is our great hope as believers and followers of Christ, that we too will know bodily resurrection because the one who went before us first, Jesus, has risen. And it wasn't just death, resurrection, but right along with that always goes ascension. And Jesus in verse 5 talks about his ascension, which is coming. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence. Incarnation time on earth is about to be done. He's going back to be with the Father. Glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. All right. To close our time in this amazing prayer, I would just like to pull out one word that has been in each section. And I skipped over it because I wanted to put them together here at the end. And the word is glory. Now, that is not a word that you hear uh, too much. Um, I once went to a church where I began to hear it all the time. I don't remember the guy's name, but there was a guy who just said that all the time from, you know, kind of like in Kyle's style, but his favorite word was, was yeah, he just said that all the time. Glory! Wasn't the kind of church I was used to, but I sure had that word drilled into my brain. That's the word I'm going to drill into your brain right now. It's an unusual word. Um, we use it negatively in just kind of regular speech. Time. Sometimes someone could be a glory hog or they just want their own glory. Um, God's glory is not something we need to shy away from or be embarrassed that he's going to kind of go too far and not look quite, you know, right. Um, God's glory is a great thing. And let us just pull out of each of these three sections of the prayer when Jesus uses this word glory in the same order that we did it before. So starting with the prayer about believers, then to the disciples, and then this final one. So, 24b. Jesus talks about glory using these words. The glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. And it repeats what we just read in 5. The glory I had with you before the world began. And I just want to point out that even though this story that I talked about, you know, we've got the bookend of the Garden of Eden. And we've got the bookend of the scene around the throne of worshiping, worshiping the Lamb. And we've got the linchpin of Christ coming so that humans can be redeemed. It's a very human-centric focus that God has on redeeming us. But his glory exists outside of that story. He, he invites us into his story and to glorify him. But he's not like a, a needy God that just had to have some people or something to, you know, to glorify him. His glory, or if you want to say their glory, if you're talking about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, it's, it's self-contained. It existed before us. It existed when they were relating to one another as the Holy Trinity. It doesn't require that we be present in order for it to exist. We're coming on the scene as witnesses to something that already existed. It always was. Hallelujah. I don't, I don't say that word very often, just like I don't say glory very often, but hallelujah, God's glory is. Moving up to the disciples' prayer. Amen. This is a little more surprising. Verse 10b, Jesus is praying along with, or to the Father about the disciples, for the disciples. And this phrase in the second half of 10, and glory has come to me through them, caught my notice. I just thought, well, that is wild. Because we're all familiar with you know, the, the disciples sort of bumbling along and making mistakes. We know they're about to abandon Jesus, run away. We know Peter 
is going to uh, deny even who? What? I, I never heard of him. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know Jesus. Jesus knows these things about these men. He has lived with these men. He has patiently discipled these men and walked with these men as they ask him questions about who's going to be the greatest? Can we sit at the top seats? Do you want us to call fire down from heaven to smoke these people? Just time after time after time, they're, they're held up as examples. I believe for us to embrace humility because we're just like them. We just, we don't get it sometimes. And yet Jesus, while praying for them, says this, and glory has come to me through them. In other words, Jesus is satisfied with how they've done. Like what he wants is this group of growing, learning, maturing, ever more disciple, looking like Jesus people. And that's what brings him glory. It's not tied to, did they get everything right? How closely in your mind are those two things married? How much glory God gets from your life and how well you're doing at getting everything right. How much pressure does that put on you? God will get glory if, if I can just not fail. Jesus isn't tying this statement to some super disciples. It's just those regular disciples that we know. Glory has come to me through them. Our glorifying of God comes from what God does in us. Don't get me wrong. He wants to change you. He wants to disrupt many things in your life. And... If he told you all of it now, you'd probably be a little afraid. But there's no need to be afraid. Because you are also okay just how we are right now. His critique and disruption of my life is not in the categories or in the ways that I might condemn myself for. Our glorifying of God comes from what he does in us. Not from what we do for him. Ask Arun to borrow her book with, and she'll highly recommend it on that topic. All right. Last one, moving back up again to the first prayer. What did I skip in the first prayer? I skipped verse 4, and it has the word glory in it. Jesus says, <clears throat> excuse me, I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. Wait, what? Finished? It is finished? That's famous. When did Jesus say it is finished? Where was he? Oh, one of, one of his phrases while he died on the cross. It is finished. Are you familiar with this statement of Jesus saying, I have finished the work, Father, that you gave me to do? The cross, and I'm going to try and say this clearly. I'm not trying to not say it clearly. I promise. But I'm wrestling with this. So the, so the cross is Jesus' prayer in verse 1. right? The, the cross is how the Father will glorify Jesus. He will ascend his throne with his death. How does Jesus glorify the Father, though? It's this verse. I finished the work you gave me to do. In other words, God is glorifying Jesus at the cross. But Jesus here is saying, I have brought glory to you, Father, by living. Everything I've done up till now, I've finished the work you gave me to do. If you assume that the entirety of everything that matters in your faith is 
Jesus came to earth so that he could die for my sins, so that I could go to heaven. Well, you've just named what you care about, right? By using so that. If that's the extent of your assumption, I just want you to ask, do you have a, is there a good answer then for why Jesus didn't come and just do that? Just come and just die. And is there a good answer for why I'm still here? I'm telling you, his life matters. This is the other side of the question. Jesus' matter, Jesus' life, what he did, what he taught, what he said, how he lived, what he prayed for us, it matters tremendously for how we live. Yes, his death matters. Of course. We, we've just we've gotten that. We've understood that. I'm not sure we've understood how much how he lived as recorded in these gospels. should guide and steer how we live. That's discipleship. And that's a lot harder. It's way harder. In, in your 50s, to like try to shed bad habits of how you relate to people or treat people or think about certain things or think about all kinds of issues and allow discipleship to actually continue to break down the things that need to be broken down and change the things that need to be changed. It's a lot easier to not worry about that if you think being a Christian just means I got the fire insurance. Okay. Amen. Me too. But Jesus has invited us into a new way of being human that fills our lives now with how do we live then? How shall we follow this Jesus? Whom one day, yes, we will see his face in all its glory. How Jesus lived the human life gave the Father glory, including laying it down, which began long before the cross. And your eternal life begins long before the afterlife. Let me close. If there is worship team coming, that's fine if they come now. I, I would just like to close our time in this truly amazing prayer. This window onto Father and the Son communing. Jesus petitioning the Father for important things. I would just like to return to the prayer for us. Because this is where it's most personal. And I would just like to read some of those words from Eugene Peterson's translation of the original Greek texts and just have you actually in a posture of prayer close your eyes and hear Jesus pray for you. I pray for those who will believe in me because of these disciples and their witness about me. The goal is for all of them to become one heart and mind. Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. So they might be one heart and mind with us. Then the world might believe that you, in fact, sent me. The same glory you gave me, I gave them. So they'll be as unified and together as we are. I in them. And you in me. Then they'll be mature in this oneness. And give the godless world evidence that you've sent me. And love them in the same way you've loved me.
free to continue to do so. But if you'd like to join us in worship, feel free to stand and join us as we end the song. strong the hand that holds us beautiful so beautiful so
every person you see is the image of God. Don't stop until you've made eye contact with someone from each of the other three sections in the room and at least given them a nod or a wave or blow them a kiss or especially blow a kiss to my mother. We do a lot of things as a church. We cannot keep and claim that name church unless we are always also at the same time always seeking more unity among us. We must. It's what God wants. It's what Jesus petitioned his Father for on our behalf. It isn't easy. We're, we're people. But this is what the church can be. People who should not love each other loving each other. Freed from having to relate to one another according to the rules of the world. Bickering, jealousy, racism, arguments, pride. Free. Free to be brothers and sisters. And that's not always easy either, brothers and sisters, am I right? Or mother who raised brothers and sisters. It's not easy. get to unity. We dare not ignore unity. Pretend we have it and just go out and get busy making impact. We won't make any impact without unity. I hope you'll stay for GBM. We promise you will not miss a second of the pregame. Well, at least the pregame close to the pregame. We need you. We need us. God wants all of us. I'm going to close with the common benediction of the Lord bless you and keep you. But our ears usually hear that individually. Ah, the Lord turn his face upon me. Hear it in the plural. Hear every you, not as you, but as you. The Lord bless you and keep you. forgotten the next line. The Lord shine his face upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord turn his face toward you. Journey Church of Atlanta. Journey, or all churches in Atlanta. All believers turn his face toward you and give you peace. And he is already receiving glory now from us, doing this together. He's not waiting until you get it better. He's receiving glory from what we're doing now and inviting us into more glory.